Right, we are back with another panel, our second panel for ModCon. We have some new faces, still amazing guests, there is no doubt about that. And so let me get to their names. The one is Michael and the other one is Rodney. Um, well, they couldn't make it, unfortunately, so we had to get these guys in. And it's obviously Nate from WASD20. Welcome, Nate. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. And then we got Seth from Seth Skorkowski. Yeah. Hi, thanks for having me. There you go. It's great having you both on. We were just uh, chatting beforehand. We haven't hung out before. Well, we haven't hung out since Gen Con last year. And we had a great, t great, great time then. So hopefully we're going to have a great time tonight. So we are talking about mastering the basics. So this is game mastering the basics. And it's not system specific, I don't think. I think it doesn't matter what you play, it's kind of going to be the same thing. But the rules might be difficult, different, but but otherwise it's it's pretty much the same. Do you guys agree agree on that? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Similar skills and um, pretty transferable skills, I would say, between games. There we go. Perfect. So um, to, to just establish, you know, aside from everybody who knows who you are anyway, there might be one or two people who don't know who you guys are. So very quickly, how long have you been running D and D game, or not D and D? How long have you been running role playing games for, uh, Nate? Let's say, let's ask you. How long have you been going for it? So for me, it's not been that long. I think it was twenty fourteen when I started. So, uh, you know, I was, I was in my thirties already when I, when I found RPGs and fell in love with them and uh, started running games. There you go. There you go. Well, I mean, that's still six years. That's half a decade. Yeah. I mean, it's not bad. It's not bad. Longer than some people have been alive. <laughs> a few. Yeah. Million. <laughs> <laughs> Seth, how long have you been playing games for? Well, role playing uh, games. Uh, 20 years, um, uh, what was I, I just totaled it in my head, 28 years. 28 years, yes. Yeah. Now yeah. tell me to get off your lawn. <laughs> just, I don't need any help hearing that I'm old. <laughs> there you go. So, so quite a lot of experience. I'm also in the 20 plus kind of category. The 25 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think, well, I mean, there's a reason why some games cap out at 20, right? Because there's no point in counting beyond that point. Because oh, it's you, you kind of this. What do you like most about running games? Seth, let's start with you. Honestly, I love being able to get my friends together and have just a ton of laughs. Uh, I like running because I like to I'm a showman, so I like to reveal some, you know, big to do with my friends. So that's that's the big thing I get is telling a story and getting a ton of laughs with my buddies. There you go. Nate? Yeah, similar. I think that, you know, just having a good time with your friends and in some ways kind of uh, hosting the good time uh, for your friends is really gratifying. And I also think there's just so many um, creative aspects of game mastery and RPGs in general. Um, you know, there, there's just, you know, I could count a dozen different creative paths you can focus on, whether it's painting miniatures or um, writing stories or world building or whatever. There's just so much there. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And I also, what I like is to see people's eyes light up when they're remembering a game they played and they, they're retelling the story. Because uh, you're going, well, I was part of helping make that person have that happy memory. And then we all can relive that memory, which kind of feels real, even though it definitely wasn't real, you know? Uh, so there's, a, yeah, anyway, all right, that's lovely. That's lovely. We've got some questions already coming uh, in. Uh, Gextrol asks, and this is specifically for Seth, apparently, um, is Jack holding the camera? Uh, well, Jack is in the hat, is, is up on the, the wall up there laughing and telling me not to pick my nose. So he's he's behind the scenes. There you are. We, and if you don't know who Jack is, uh, we, we'll share all the links to all the channels <laughs> and then you can find out uh, all about that. What do you do? This is another question from Frank G135. What do you do for NPC voices so they sound different or does it not really matter? I find I hate sounding the same. Nate, what are your thoughts? 
So I do struggle with that for sure. Um, that feeling of like, oh man, I did the same voice for these two characters, which is the same voice I used for this one last session. And um, but I, I feel like um, it, I'm getting better. It certainly helps to plan it ahead of time. But you know, last time I I had an NPC that I knew I was going to be running, and then I realized like about one second before he opened his mouth, I didn't plan a voice for this one. <laughs> and that was fine. Uh, it worked out okay. And I made him unique and it helped that he was very inebriated. And um, <laughs> uh, so, and the other thing is you don't need to, to do voices. You know, you don't, that's not a requirement by any means. And you can have a great time without them. There you are. And uh, Seth, your thoughts? My secret is I do terrible impersonations of, of characters from, from movies or TV shows or, or video games, like kind of reimagined as this, uh, this character. So it's not necessarily impersonating an actor, I'm usually impersonating a role that they played, but badly, because I'm terrible in impersonations. So most people cannot identify that I'm stealing it from anywhere. They just think I'm a genius. <laughs> That's the trick. Steal it. Just be bad at stealing it. Just, and just, then you'll be good. Steal it, even if you suck at it. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that's... I, if I were to weigh in, my only piece of advice would be that if you can't do voices, um, it's probably a healthy mental state because I know I do voices all the time, even when I'm not playing games. Um, it just happens. You, you just go where you go. You know what I'm saying. And then people go, I don't even know what accent that is. You're like, I don't know either, but I don't care. <laughs> it is what I'm sounding like today. Thank you very much. Um, one thing you can do is instead of relying on the voice, start relying on the other uh, senses. So describe it more than, than try and enact it. So you can say the character has a strange lisp when they speak and they say the following, I wish you could go and rescue my daughter from the mill. But at least you've told them that it has a lisp and then try and attach something else to that. So they have a lisp and they smell of mustards or mustard seed. I don't know. Attach something else to it and then the PCs will remember it more than if you just do a lispy voice and they try and speak like this or whatever the situation might be. So it's entirely up to you. I do want to say one thing. I demand you do the rest of this with that voice. With the okay. th No, I don't think I could. I, I think my <laughs> microphone would stop working. I do want to point out though, and this is something that I've seen, and I'm sorry I'm hijacking this here, but this is the advantage of being the host, is <laughs> do you guys feel that it is wrong to do voice impersonations? Do you think it's like it's stealing or it's mocking? So if you if you do an, an Irish accent, are the Irish all going to be up in arms and start screaming about it and running around? Or, or, or what, are, what are your guys' thoughts? Just quickly. No. Nate? No, I would say no. You, you don't I have to go for it. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, I, you know, there is a certain point at which I could see like certain accents um, sometimes being offensive to people um, to certain people groups, but um, the voices I usually do, I don't think border on that. Uh, well, yeah, and if, yeah. if, if, if you're butchering it, then, well, that's just how the elves here talk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a Russian difference between I'm going to do uh, an Asian accent and I'm going to be Mickey Rooney from Breakfast at Tiffany's. I mean, there's there's a big difference between the two and you just kind of uh, stick on one side of that. But exactly. Yeah, that's. I don't see. I don't see a problem with it because you're not. If you're not doing it to be like a caricature, and you're just doing it to like this is how they talk to trying to express this. No, I don't see a problem with it. There you go. I agree completely. Okay, back to script. Otherwise, I get fired. Um, so when we when we start about when we start talking about the basics, the very basics. Where do you start in terms of coming up with your game? Do you start big? Do you start small? Are you, uh, there's some, there's phrasing like top down or, or bottom up or big to small, small to big. Uh, where do you start in terms of coming up with your, your very first game as part of a campaign, I would, I would guess. Uh, and Seth, let's throw that to you. That entirely depends on the campaign. Uh, uh -huh. Some some campaigns, yes, I have started with an with an overarching concept, and then others I have literally start with a tiny little thing, and, and and it works that way for for all writing. I've had entire novels that I've written based off of 
one little scene and it's like well let's figure out what the hell this was about and others that started with a big plot and then you have to like kind of get further down to figure out where the characters are so it's case by case just kind of wherever the creativity hits you that's your starting point and then you build from there nate yeah i mean at least when i was brand new even though i'd played a lot of uh, computer role-playing games even though i had read D, D novels and other fantasy novels i still honestly struggled with how to put it all together and what a what an rpg session was so i i really relied on a, a couple of modules i had rise of the rune lords and uh, a couple others you know adventures and those kind of helped me just in the beginning uh, kind of set the tone for what sorts of things you do in a role-playing game session. And um, so that's my recommendation, but I don't think you need those, certainly. Some people make amazing adventures, their very first time GMing just off the top of their head. And uh, so everyone's different in that way. Mm. Do you guys start with a map? Do you, ever, do you ever kind of go map first? Or is it idea that I need a map? Does a map even feature? Nate? Yeah, I, I don't start with a map usually, um, even though I'm like known for drawing maps. Yeah. Um, I, in some ways, my map drawing is is separate sometimes from any role playing game stuff and, and even separate from world building in a way, which sounds crazy, but I just doodle maps because I like to doodle things. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I usually start with yeah, a story. Maybe it's a town where you know I imagine a conflict. Um, maybe it's yeah, just a, a story and, and two characters um, something like that. Seth, do you have a, do you start with maps? How, how important are I've, maps to you? I've never started with the map. Um, in, in fantasy, I almost always have a map. Um, I will either come up with the map, like after I've got the plot or it kind of goes in conjunction as I'm filling out the plot, I'll start doing a map and that'll help feed the plot ideas. But I've never just started with a map and then said like, well, let's put an adventure here. It's always, a concept and then the map starts either immediately or further after i know when i'm doing stuff i start i have the idea it's like oh i want to have a battle on a, a mountain top with lightning bolts and some giant demon thing or I, I, there's a little crypt and i want people to explore it when i'm writing the adventure I, I i might before i start writing go okay well this is the map but then as i'm writing the adventure i go Oh, well, this would be cooler. So now instead of it being a nice open field, now it's lava because that's more interesting. And I, it sort of evolves. So I think, do you, do you think people get stuck going, I came up with this plan and now I have to enact this plan. And I, if, I, if I can't enact it, I get stuck. Do you think, do you think that happens? Yeah. Seth, uh, yeah. In, in writing, it's referred to as your darlings. Uh, so it's part of the, the phrase, kill your darlings, because sometimes you fall in love with some idea so much that you can no longer see that it's no, it, it's, you should have moved past it. So uh, yes, people can get stuck on some little minutia that ends up holding them back in the long run. Mm. Nate, yeah, and, yeah, similarly, I think a lot of people feel like they have to have everything figured out before they start. Um, and don't realize the benefit of not having it figured out <laughs> and that sometimes your players can write the best story and sometimes, um, yeah, it, it just helps to kind of kind of build in wet cement and, uh, and be flexible. Um, there's nothing wrong with spending, you know, a six months world building and drawing this pristine map and then introducing it to your players. But um, there is a benefit to being a little more flexible than that. There you go. There you go. Okay. I like that. I really do like that. I know talk about that flexibility. Um, I was running a game the other day and the player in their backstory, they had come from a town on a, on a, on a world map that I had drawn and somehow an NPC asked them. So what is your, what a, a fellow player actually asked them, what's your hometown like? And the player went, uh, GM, what's the hometown like? And I went, uh, why don't you tell me? It's just, Tell us what you think your hometown is like. And so as they were saying it, I was making my notes on what this town is like. And now when they go back there, that's exactly what it's going to be like. And that's part of the fun, I think, is, is it, you're exploring your own world through your players. I, I, it blows my mind when people want to fix everything down firsthand. Anyway, right, let's get to some questions that have popped through. I'm going to randomly choose them. There are so many questions coming through here, folks. It's brilliant. 
Um, okay, uh, right. That's not. I mean, I'm going to ask questions that are sort of relevant to the panel that we're talking about. The Warp Ghost says, "How much note taking and in how much detail do you think the GM should be doing during a session? How do you judge what's relevant to retain and what isn't?" Oh goodness. Uh, Nate, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so I think <clears throat> definitely some of the essentials would be NPC names. So they ask the name of the bartender or the the stable owner, and you didn't plan it, but now you make something up, and you got to write that down, <laughs> or or record your session. That's another thing, you know, if it's recorded. But even though I stream games and I have them on video, I don't really want to watch three hours again. <laughs> you know, I'd rather just write it down. Um, so. That's something that, you know, I think is essential. And there's a few other things like that, you know, like an in name or, a, you know, a place name, these things that you're coming up with on the spot. Uh, it, it's very helpful to write them down. And it's honestly one of the things I struggle with most. And it's one of those things I've been telling myself more consciously in the last year or so, like, I got to do this. I got to get better at taking notes. <laughs> Absolutely. Seth? Um, I, man, I'm all about notes, uh, cause I'm even making them while Nate was talking. So I wouldn't forget what to say. Um, so yes, a, a, a dramatis persona of your characters is, is pretty handy to have. So you can at least keep their names straight. And also the names I am terrible about. I'll come up with the greatest plot. I'll come up with the greatest map. And then I will not have remembered the part where I'm supposed to name any of this crap. So then they're like, you know, then the King walks up, what's his name? I was like, jerry yeah <laughs> just completely lame but um so jot that stuff down i cheat in the sense that for we always have a, a person who's scribing the game journal and so sometimes i've been like it's like oh and you meet you go back and you meet your patron wizard and what was the wizard's name again and they'll flip things like you know jerry everybody in your world's named jerry and they'll be like jerry the wizard and we keep going but uh definitely jot down like the names of the towns or anything important like that if you're feeling really, really, really industrious, write down a one or two word adjective to describe them, to remind mm. yourself a little bit about them. Don't give them a bio, but it's like angry. And then you can usually remember that that's Jerry the Angry Wizard. There we go. Solid advice. Absolutely, absolutely solid advice. I hate taking notes as well uh, because I want to be in the game. I want to be there. I don't want to be scribing down stuff absolutely so yeah the less notes you can make the better uh, but just give some relevancy to it because otherwise you end up with a note and you're like what does green brown mean what is green oh. brown where does green brown come from is it Those is it best a little riddle right? to yourself you could find months later you're like what the hell was i what was this <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly um, I, I, yeah there we go i um, think also if you if you just uh if you're not very good at taking notes in the moment because i'm with you guy i'm the guy who's also like don't take photos just enjoy seeing it yes, right? right same way be in the moment uh but you can just sit down after the game you know your friends have left yeah you're tired you might want to go to bed but just sit down and spend 10 minutes just jotting down some things that you don't want to forget another little trick which i will give to you is it's amazing when you go i'm going to jot this down you don't jot it down the next day you're like oh i should make my notes and you're going well that was easy i don't remember anything so that's fine just text your players. Hey guys, do you guys remember the name of the wizard? I, I've got some options here and I just want to be clear on which one it is. For one inspiration, the person who texts me back the name of the wizard is. There we go. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So that question was from the Warp Ghost. I'm going to take another one from the chat because I think it's quite a good one. Um, ben Canal 81 says, how do, uh, uh, how do find adapting, mastering different systems? For example, between 2D20 and D&D &D and Call of Cthulhu. So how do you deal with moving between systems? Do you move between systems? I mean, Seth, I know that you, you play quite a broad spectrum of different games. Nate, are, are you playing outside of the big D&D &D realm? I don't very often, but I try to, you know, bite off a few new ones a year, really. It's mm -hmm. kind of what I'll do. And, you know, sometimes that's one shots. But um, yeah, like I, I've run some uh, Tales from the Loop um right. at a couple of different cons just to spice things up um index card rpg but yeah i mean it, it is tricky uh at first but it's just i mean just like anything when you, when you know the system fairly well it's it becomes really easy to switch between i've i've found the hardest part is just at first um especially if you get in the habit of playing the same one over and over again and then the new one comes in 
But um, yeah, I think uh, it does. And, and when you get more experience with new systems, it helps you in, in switching between systems more easily. Right, because you're starting to recognize patterns and go, okay, well, this is how this one does that. This is how this one does that. Uh, Seth, you, I mean, you play, I, I, I can't keep track. We're like four on the shelf behind me. Um, <laughs> I, I play a lot of different systems. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and I, like the first 17 years I gave, I was like, you know, D&D or death, everything else is like crappy wannabe. And now I'm like, I play everything in the world. So once you get used to, as they said, that, that learning a different system and like having to break a lot of those hard molds in your brain, as far as like, this is what these mechanics mean. And you start being a little bit more fluid. The second game is, is a little hard, then the third's easier, and the fourth's easier. And after that, you can just go between them. The initial read-through is, is a bit awkward because you're sometimes they'll use terminology that means mm. something else in another game. I find that worse if you're doing an addition change. I find doing an addition change way harder yeah. than switching games altogether. Like if, if you're doing first edition something and second edition is released, it's like, Oh crap, I have to unlearn all the stuff that I learned because it's now wrong. And that to me is way harder than picking up a totally different game and just starting from the ground up. Do you think it's important? I know I do this um, when I'm, I'm reading new systems is I'm constantly going, read the rule. Oh, but this is how you do it in my favorite system. And then comparing and going, well, this one's stupid. Or going, this is brilliant. I'm going to steal this for when I'm running my normal game. Is that, is that something that you guys do or? or? Well, the, the, the theft, um, like inspiration. I've, I have used inspiration in Call of Cthulhu and Traveler and Conan already had it, but you know, it's like, I, I, I will steal mechanics or techniques that work well in one system because why would I leave something that works well behind if the rules for one game don't really accommodate it? But when I am learning a new system, if I read a rule that is goofy and weird and I'm like, that's stupid, I will always try it as is because I have been wrong so many times and then we've tried it. And it's like, well, hell, that really is great. If I had followed my instinct and house ruled it out, we would have broken the game or missed out on it. So I always try it. And then I start deleting and changing stuff if, if it doesn't work the way I like it. But other times I, I love it. Yeah. Any thoughts, Nate? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, as one example, like I've got Blades on the Dark back there and I'm just waiting for, you know, a good like heist mission in a and d game where I can use some of that stuff, you know. Uh, so absolutely, I think, uh, you know, cobbling things together and, and finding systems that serve even your individual game session uh, can be really cool. Absolutely. Okay, how do you build monster encounters? How do you build monster encounters? So try to keep it system generic because I think the approach is similar across. If I think of all the different systems I've played, you, do you go for balance? Do you go for theatricality? Do you go for based on play? What, what do you do? So Nate, what do you do? Yeah, so I, I definitely try to find ways to make it more than just uh, the monsters, make it more dynamic than just meat shield hitting meat shield. Um, so sometimes that means adding mechanics if the mechanics don't seem exciting enough or environmental effects or things like that. But, um, you know, I definitely use some of the, the rule systems guides as a guide for me, but ultimately I think you just got to sit down and look at those stats if you're going for balance and, you know, ignore challenge rating or whatever else they use um, to some extent, just to say like, okay, let me look at these stats and use my knowledge of my party to see if this is balanced. If you're going for balance and you don't need to, because sometimes the best story is the one where the PCs run away or die. I've yet to meet a runaway. Um, I, you always kind of hope it's like, guys, you really could just run away, but you can't say that out loud, really. Um, yeah, Seth? Um, it, it kind of explains so what, what, what Nate brought up is the environment like where where are the monsters how are they going to behave based off of their their environment like you know you're not just on a flat featureless plane so you you want the the monsters to be natural for that environment and to be using that environment against the the pcs kind of like to their advantage and uh as far as keeping it balanced uh, since challenge rating really isn't a thing in any of the games that I play. It's just going to like, keep it, keep it reasonable. 
and if if uh, if the PCs run away, then then great, they're going to come back with a plasma rifle and 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 clear house. But uh, but don't forget the environment that the monster's in because that can usually make the monster encounter a thousand times better if you are really incorporating the the scene versus just a monster jumps in front of you, roll initiative, and we're just going to go back and forth, back and forth till it dies, and it's just hit points in armor class that's boring mm -hmm. so make the make it move and do stuff that's that's what's cool do you guys ever use uh sort of a random oh look i rolled some dice and it says that you must have an encounter with a table that i must look up and it says it's 12 <laughs> bugbears or you know 12 demented nazis from the planet x do, do you guys ever use those not in a very 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 long time <laughs> nate yeah, i I generally don't. And if there are random encounters, sometimes I'll roll beforehand, like wh while I'm planning the game. And then if I don't get something like, I'm like, eh, you know what? I'm just gonna pick that one. <laughs> um, and that that tends to work for me. Um, so not, yeah, not too often. Seconding doing all that beforehand, like I'll put on my map, like here in this hallway, is there a random encounter with something? Because during the game, I'm not going to remember to pull out that chart. And then after the session's over, you'd be like, ah, oh, damn it, I never gave them any random encounters. So they're not random. I, they're planned. But yeah. yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I also say with monsters when planning encounters is the monsters should always have an objective. Um, I, 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 I abhor the idea that there is a minotaur in the maze and the minotaur is not doing anything except waiting for people to come in and die. Um, that minotaur is doing something. It might be crocheting, it might be stamp collecting, but it, it will be doing something before the PCs arrive. And once they are dead or have left, it will be doing something else. And I know it sounds silly, but for me, it helps me go, well, this, this monster, yes, he's supposed to kill the, you know, the intruders, but he also happens to have a wife and kids at home and he doesn't really want to necessarily die. <laughs> so sometimes the monsters should be giving up as well and not just fighting to the death. Um, and it, it helps me if I'm going, well, yes, he, you know, he has a philatelist's meeting coming up and he really doesn't want to miss that because there's this really cool stamp coming up. Um, I was collecting, isn't it? It, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It may have been a passing hobby of mine not, not this long ago. Um, <laughs> right. Now, another question that has come through. Uh, Volkadog says Are there any simple tricks to build confidence quickly if you're a new to GMing? Any tricks? Any quick, quick tricks? Nate? I would say do it more. <laughs> I mean, if you want to get good at riding a bike, you ride more. I, um, it's going to be, it, it'll probably, for most of us, I would say, it's pretty rocky at first. And it's, it's pretty like, oh boy, I, that didn't go well. And you did that. And I could do that better. And I would say that's most of us. There are those, you know, naturals who just, they're amazing. But um, I, hate it's, I would compare it I, I to um, <laughs> my, um, my, my son got a uh, hoverboard for Christmas. One of these like two wheeled kind of like segue sort of things where you, and it's been a lot of fun just, <laughs> playing around with that every single person who's tried it the first time is just they look like an absolute fool and they're like moving like an inch a minute like right mm. and then you know you just you, you get used to it and it's like this is cool i look like i'm in the future and that's kind of how it is with gming i think for most of us where it's just like you just do it more just do it more yeah so, uh, seth uh, once again I, I, everything was like what he said uh it is, is don't be afraid to fail uh, and, and don't don't be afraid to laugh at yourself and for the love of God, don't forget to have fun. Um, I think a lot of new GMs get so knotted up that it has to be perfect uh, the first time or it has to hit some impossible standard that they forget the biggest core fundamental truth. This is about fun. So that's all that actually matters. Um, but if, if, you, if you screw up, cool, learn from it and um, move on. I think that's good advice. I think that's really, really, really good advice. I also think it's important to have people playing with you who are supporting you on your journey. Uh, if you've got players who are incredibly, you know, if they've got 10 years of experience, you've got nothing. Uh, hopefully they will be the ones who support you going, well, I thought your session was great. I do think it was a little bit overpowered or you maybe were too have, giving out too much treasure or to give you critical feedback, but to, to, to give it to you in a way that's constructive, not to go, no, you suck as a GM, you should never play ever again. 
Um, so, because that's advice I was given. I was told at a convention, you should never role play ever again. Just go away. You suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Hard to believe. <laughs> let it out, guy. Yeah, got to let it out. <laughs> um, how do you prep for NPC dialogue? Do you have pages and pages and pages of conversation starters and small talk prop prompts or what do you do uh let's go seth um no uh i i don't really prepare i'll i'll usually come up with my voice sometimes i'll know the voice beforehand if it's like a major npc but half the time it's like they walk in the room and he's like this and i usually get a personality um like that adjective if I find myself using a certain word a lot, you know, and they're like, indubitably, I will remember that this person just says that word a lot to kind of hit a flow. I might have like a couple brief notes of like, make sure when they're talking, these are the points I need to bring up, but I don't write out the dialogue or anything because that's not natural. That becomes like a module. You got to read that page and a half of stuff and nobody's listening and you're bored reading it. So now I just, I make a couple notes of what I'm going to say and, that, and just go. Yeah. Nate? Yeah, I think uh, in terms of dialogue, one of the big things for me is like knowing their, <clears throat> the NPC's motivation or goal. Uh, and if, if you know that, then you can act naturally. And that, that can take a little bit of work to figure out if, you know, you're running a module and it's not clear or, mm. um, <clears throat> or if you're, it's an NPC you didn't expect them to interact with, um, you might have to kind of make up a, a goal for them. Um, but that really helps you get in their head a little bit. And then the conversation just flows. Understand that better. I agree. You both have run from modules. Would you recommend new GMs to, to or, or even experienced GMs to, to pick up some modules and to run, even if it's just one shot, from a module? Um, Nate? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's totally a matter of taste. Uh, it's a toss up to me. But I, I think it is worthwhile when you're new to... Um, to try a little bit of each. Um, yeah, I, I think if you're strictly running for modules, uh, especially try, try not once and, and see how it goes. Uh, even if it's just a one shot, um, I think that's a great way to kind of test the water. Mm. Seth? Um, running for modules is, is a matter of taste. I think it's critical that you read modules, but you don't actually have to, to run them because reading modules teaches you different ways of putting a game together or different ways of, of doing the story. Um, uh, especially if you're trying out different systems, you can kind of see what the system's like by the, the modules that are out there. And it's not as important whether you run that module. You can steal as many ideas as you want because modules are spectacular places to steal from. I, I have a ton of old modules I've never run, but I have stolen individually every single aspect of that module in 15 different games. So I, I think they're actually extremely important that a GM read to expand their toolbox as far as different ideas and different concepts and different ways of organizing it that they just might not have come up with. Um, and if they like it enough to run it, by all means, run it and have fun. But uh, I, I think they're a valuable resource to at least look at. Mm. Mm. it's almost that's really our equivalent of of studying how the other 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 teams are playing a sport for example or just literally that's that's our go-to material because we could watch film and we can read books and we can we can do all of that kind of stuff which is still is creative narrative but it's not the very special thing that we do which is we're telling a story and we have five other people or six other people all contributing to that so it's, a, it's quite a unique form of of creative whatever you would call it hobby i suppose so there we are all right let me go to some other questions before i get lost in that particular thought um okay well here we go broom ball dude asks what is the most careless person your party has ever found or encountered and what trouble did the careless one cause Those are always interesting questions because my brain starts going through 23 or four years of role playing going, well, there was that one, there was that one, there was that one. And I can't remember any of their actual stories. Uh, Nate, you got someone? Careless? So are we talking about NPCs in or a game? PC. It says PC or NPC. Oh. What is the most careless person oh, your party ever found or included? Uh, PC or NPC? 
I honestly can't think of any right now. So maybe we should start with Seth because okay, I'm, it's gonna Seth. I'm struggling. Um, so I'm going to answer this wrong. Uh, so when, when you said PCs, my brain went to a specific encounter we had where the, the players absolutely forget something ridiculously obvious. And the whole time you're sitting there going like, is this really happening? And we were doing the adventure White Plume Mountain. And there is a scene where you have to get across a, a chasm of boiling mud or something. And they figure out this great way. They're inside of a cube of force and they had a rope tied to it. And a guy on the other side who was going to pull it across. And they were all inside and they were great. And as it started pulling up to the edge, like right at the last second, I had the NPC like, excuse me, sir, it occurs to me. And then they fell a hundred feet into this, this thing of mud that didn't occur to them that they were going to fall off of a cliff as part of the plan. And it was like, they went through this huge elaborate plan. I'm like, you guys aren't taking into account the fact there's a cliff. So those are the ones that, that make me laugh is because when the reveal happens, you're like, oh my God, but that was it. Yeah, yeah. I, I have had in a recent game, I think I've used this story before, but it's, it's a good one. I did have a party drop a building on top of a party member, which it happens. You know, you have a tower the tower has four supports, northeast, southwest, right? And when the party knocks out the west support and the east support and then blast the tower, it's going to go one way or the other. And when they blast it from one way and the PC is standing in the shadow of the collapse, um, again, it's one of those moments where you're like, you have a map. You can see what's going You haven't cut down trees before, have you? because it's going to go down on top of this person um uh yeah so that was that was quite fun uh, to watch to watch that happening um but in the heat of the moment you panic as a player you panic right i mean i've done stupid things as a player it's like oh i uh, pull out my sword or anyway uh, nate well, you've had a, a thought or yeah, there. I've run games for high school students. I teach high school, and I've also played in games where I've had brand new high school GMs, and so those are really interesting. And and there's definitely been a couple uh, where where there have been players who are just just being trolls and just trying to mess with the group. And uh, and I would say that so there was one that was you know just. Um, basically seemed like he wanted to murder another member of the party. So that's, that's my story. And, uh, you know, that was a good learning experience. We had some good conversations about it afterwards because <laughs> it, it was for a class. <laughs> I, um, in old, like first edition D and D when uh, lightning bolts went to their maximum length and they bounced off of walls and they could hit the caster again. Uh, if you do have a spell cast that's not paying attention and it becomes the death pinball as it shoots around the room and just somehow hits every freaking person when you're going along the map, that was, oh man, that, that was good times. Good times. I do remember those rules where it was more physics and less uh, player friendly. When I remember lightning bolt, if you were touching the target that was hit, you got hit yeah. as well because that's how lightning works if you're touching the thing being struck right well if you if you thought strategically you could hit multiple opponents and you yeah. could hit an opponent multiple times but uh if you weren't paying attention oh god it was hilarious <laughs> but uh i got really good at geometry in high school because of because of lightning bolts so <laughs> I, I should have taken uh, yeah all right lightning bolt anyway yeah. Um, last question before we're out of time. So um, I'm torn. I'm torn. I'm going to take Murph 247365's question. What is your top tip for planning your first campaign? I mean, it's a massive question, but top tip off of the most, most relevant one you can think of. Nate? Uh, conflicts you know, think about the conflicts, think about, uh, it, it can be uh, in a town, it can be, and, and you can start small, and then, you know, hopefully the campaign expands beyond the town, if it's a campaign, uh, yeah. or you can think uh, on the, the kingdom or world level or planet level, uh, but thinking of those conflicts and what's going on, and then uh, ways to kind of draw your party into them, I think is, is my top tip. And it could be one conflict or it could be three conflicts. Okay. And when you say conflict, you mean with the party or just dark in the world? The world. 
Okay. Yep. Dark. Yes. Dark overlord or um, a plague or um, it doesn't have to be a person. It can be a natural conflict as well. Nice. Um, but uh, something that's that's going wrong or someone who's planning something nefarious. Ah, Seth. Well, I'm going to real quickly agree with uh, with Nate there. Uh, probably the best campaign I ever ran was Cyberpunk, and it all took place in a four by four block of 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 Night City. 16 blocks whole campaign played it for a year and it was probably the best i ever did so it wasn't even the whole town it was like a borough um that's awesome mine would be realize that when the campaign starts at that moment you have lost control of it it is no longer yours uh when you're when you're writing a book you have absolute control all the way through and when you're writing a campaign you have absolute control up into the instant it starts and then it is a group project um and so i think a lot of gms get themselves in trouble because they try to keep that control going and not just let the players do what players do and and have fun in this world that that we would now all have together so that would be mine there we go that that is absolutely absolutely both of you brilliant 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 ideas on starting your campaign um i do think the other thing that you should do is if it is going to be your first campaign is do not try and start your first 20 year campaign try and start your first three month campaign start little and then if, if everyone had a good time when you get to the end of it then you can start another one that's the amazing thing about a hobby you don't just play one game and then that's it you've used up your quota of role playing that's it thank you very much um so yes start on a smaller scale and then go into your magnum opus 20 books worth of material <laughs> nate where can people find you so they can get more of your amazing insight and training yeah so i have uh the youtube channel wasd20 you can just search for that i also have a new live channel where i'm running games every other monday i'm running icewind dale campaign so that's wasd20 live youtube.com slash wasd20 live Right. And I'm on most of the social media things too. There you go. And Seth? Um, well, you can find my YouTube channel at the highly imaginative name, Seth Skorkowski. Uh, good luck spelling that. And I am on Twitter uh, under S Skorkowski. And I'm usually just rambling about whatever movie or TV show I'm watching at the time or my, my fights with home repairs. But usually I'll, I might throw in something funny periodically. But... Uh, and then after that, I am a novelist, so you can find all of my, my books, also under the name Seth Skorkowski. It's weird how they're all have the same name, but, um, but that's it. What's up with that? I noticed no mention of a Jerry in there. Well, I'm working toward it, man. I don't know if I'm Would you adopt that as your yet. second name, Seth Jerry Skorkowski? I mean, it doesn't uh, go very well. No, no, oh. no. I, 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 I don't think I'm worthy of the word Jerry, name Jerry yet. I have to like level up before I can, <laughs> I can be worthy of that. I will say, I think the next game I'm running, like Jerry's just going to come out. You've cursed me, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> What's Jerry? Like, Jerry. They're all Jerry. Damn it. It's another Jerry. You're in Jerryville. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks, that's it from us. There's another panel coming up next, which is on uh what's it on it's on uh, uh taking your gm techniques to the next level and that is myself and uh seth again uh with janet forbes uh, as the host for that one so that should be interesting stick around for that and then after that we've got the star trek adventures game so we um yeah look forward to seeing you there we're going to take a little break now and when we return we will be here and so hopefully will you as well until then however thank you to nate and seth for joining me tonight goodbye mm -hmm.